Hello, everyone. I'm Bob Goulder, contributing editor with Tax Notes. Welcome to the latest episode of In the Pages, where we take a closer look at some of the more popular content from our print and online publications. Today, we're going to be examining the OECD inclusive framework, specifically the Pillar 1 proposal for a revised nexus standard and profit allocation rules. Uh, now, let me be clear from the outset that the stakes here are quite high. Unless there's a new international consensus about assigning new taxing rights, we could face a series of adverse consequences. And that could include unilateral tax measures and quite possibly um, trade retaliation on a broad scale. So really, none of that sounds conducive to a healthy global economy. So the stakes here are quite high. Now, here's the problem. If you go back to last October, the OECD uh, delivered a so-called blueprint document in which they outlined the architecture of this Pillar 1 proposal. It struck a lot of people as being complicated. In fact, so complicated one could seriously question um, its administrability. Now, there's a compelling case for simplification here, and someone who's been spending a great deal of time thinking about that is our guest today, Michael J. Gretz, professor of law at Columbia Law School and professor emeritus at Yale Law School. Uh, for anyone who follows uh, tax policy, Professor Gretz needs no introduction at all. He is a luminary in the field, and we at Tax Notes were delighted when he decided to publish with us earlier this year. Uh, his recent article is directly on point. It's called A Major Simplification of the OECD's Pillar 1 Proposal. It appeared in the January 11th edition of uh, Tax Notes, and it's, I believe, as relevant today as it was then, perhaps more so when you take into consideration the recent evolution of the U.S. Uh, engagement with the deliberative process here. So without further ado, Professor Gretz, welcome to In the Pages. Thank you, Bob. Glad to be here. So it's been an interesting uh, last couple of weeks, hasn't it? Um, things are happening uh, just since you published this piece with Tax Notes. Earlier this month, we caught a glimpse uh, of a slide deck that uh, Treasury officials presented to a steering committee of the inclusive framework that, that gives us just a taste uh, of, of where this might be headed now that the, the US Treasury is taking a more engaged role. And these Treasury slides, well, they're, they're heavy on this concept. Uh, they use the term comprehensive scoping. Uh, and the theory really is that this would displace the previous scoping concepts related to automated digital services or whether a taxpayer is a consumer facing business. From the outset, let me get your thoughts on this whole scoping controversy. Well, it's a very interesting development. I, when I wrote my article, based on what I knew at the time, I thought that the OECD's limitations to what they call ADS and CFD businesses, the ones you just described, were pretty fixed at this point. And I did not really address the scoping issues in my article for tax notes. Now, the other reason I didn't address that issue was that the article had gotten quite complicated and quite long uh, without addressing those issues. Uh, but shortly after it was published, I discovered that the OECD was really open to rethinking uh, some of its uh, decisions about scoping. I think that the Treasury idea, which, as I understand it, is to limit the application of Pillar 1 to the largest 100 companies in the world. Uh, and uh, only apply it to companies that have very significant uh, residual profits, have large profit margins, um, is an idea, I think, to at least start off this new world of allocation to market countries um, with just the largest uh, companies. And I think that's an interesting idea. I actually have been somewhat reluctant to see 
pillar one expanded to include B2B businesses. That is instead of business to consumer transactions, business to business transactions. Obviously the market countries claim had seemed to be stronger with consumer facing businesses than with uh, B2B transactions. But of course the automated digital services companies are largely engaged in B2B transactions. And uh, those digital companies are the ones that the project really started with in Pillar 1 because of all of the unilateral measures uh, for digital taxes and equalization taxes and other market uh, country efforts to capture some revenues from those, those companies. The difficulty that the blueprint um, demonstrated is that if you're going to divide businesses and you have large businesses that include many different kinds of businesses, you can think about Apple, you can think about Amazon, those are the two examples I used in the, in the article. Um, then you have to divide the businesses up in some way and those divisions, which the OECD calls segmentation, uh, are not natural in the sense that they don't necessarily overlap at all with the way in which the businesses are either organized uh, for doing business or for the way they report for financial reporting purposes, which is really related to the way they're organized for doing business. Apple, for example, uh, reports on a regional basis and not on a line of business basis and is mixing up um, all of its businesses, um, some of which are, are B2B businesses, some of which are, are B2C businesses, some of which are automated, some of which are products. Um, they're all mixed up and you know they're just saying, well, this is what we have in Asia, this is what we have in Europe, this is what we have in North America and so forth. And the requirement to, do, to re-divide these businesses, to, to segment these businesses, to use the OECD's phrase, creates a lot of opportunity for mischief, I think, uh, since there are no accounting standards that would be applicable and there are no tax standards that would be applicable. And also creates, I thought, huge opportunities for disputes between countries and companies where the countries were claiming that the division among the different businesses was wrong and that they were entitled to more revenue and the countries were claiming the opposite. And one of the very important pieces, I think, of this exercise at the OECD is that uh, they achieve certainty. They emphasize that in their documents they have a proposal for an alternative dispute resolution system, which in their view is voluntary, but as I understand the treasury slides, they want it to be mandatory. And I don't know how you can have a dispute resolution procedure that will work without dramatically limiting the potential for disputes that will arise well beyond what the OECD had implied in their blueprint. Uh, as I thought about their blueprint, I thought of the many kinds of disputes that could arise, both about the allocation of revenues to the market country, but also about who, whose profits would offset that because they're determined, I think properly so, uh, to eliminate double taxation. That is, is, there's a reallocation of profits, not an additional allocation of profits, which the digital taxes and some of the other measures that are unilaterally being enacted are. And so in order to make those things mesh and have them certain, I felt like you really needed to focus as much as possible on existing information that was being produced for other purposes. And in particular, information that was being produced for book purposes, 
under either GAAP reporting, uh, generally accepted accounting principles, or IFRS, the international standards, uh, and country by country reporting, which produces a lot of information uh, after the uh, BEPS project that was not available before, but is a standardized uh, method of reporting. Now, obviously, both have their shortcomings, but they exist and, and they can be looked at. And they'll, they can certainly provide a basis for resolving disputes. So I think one of the motivations for my article and for the treasury scoping rules is the same. That is the motivation to try and achieve greater certainty uh, in this process so that we're not just creating another set of litigation administrative disputes you know, that will remind us all of transfer pricing disputes that go on for decades and the like. Um, because if that happens, this will collapse of its own, own weight, I think. Now, having said that, I think it's important to say that there is a bit of a puzzle in my mind about the principles that the Treasury is using for deciding that the Pillar one reallocation should apply only to the hundred largest companies and without regard to what they do. I mean, obviously they're gonna to have to have some carve outs. We can certainly talk about that, but, um, but it's not clear what, what exactly the principle is, except to say, these are the largest companies so they can comply the cost of compliance will be relatively small for them compared to smaller companies. Um, having fewer companies will allow the countries to um, be more careful about the allocation uh, of revenues. And picking the most profitable com com companies, as the Treasury report says, the Treasury slides say, uh, does seem to me likely to pick companies that do have a lot of intellectual property, that have operations around the world, that may be among the more facile in moving profits to low tax countries, and where the market countries may be more concerned with losing a share of revenue uh, from those countries, those companies, because they don't have a permanent establishment within within the borders of the of the country. So I think it's an interesting step. Um, I, I also think that the Treasury was concerned and properly so that limiting the project to digital companies and large consumer facing businesses was I don't want to say it was an effort but it looked a bit like other countries deciding they wanted to tax US multinationals. And uh, by just saying, we're gonna take the 100 largest in the world, there will still be a, a very large number of US companies that will be involved. But I think there will also be a number of very large uh, companies that are headquartered in other uh, countries that will be included. Um, I believe the Treasury probably took a hard look at that before they made these proposals, but I don't have any information about that. Okay, now my next question has to do with uh, what's referred to as amount A. Uh, and uh, they talk about maintaining the quantum. If you look at the Treasury, Treasury, Treasury slides, they basically say that they're, they seem flexible on how you get to amount A, because they realize um, when they put first put this out there that, that you're going to go from like thousands and thousands of companies to just a hundred multinationals, there are going to be some folks, maybe um, market jurisdictions, who are going to say, "Wait, you're just trying to shrink the pool of profits." that are gonna be subject to reallocation. And the way I read the slides, they're saying, well, no, to prove to you that we we're not just trying to shrink the size of the profits, we can adjust the, the 
the, the details of how you get to amount A so that the quantum of profits being reallocated is, is roughly the same as it was before. The way I read that is you're, you're going to have fewer taxpayers subject to amount A, but how you calculate it may have to be a lot more generous if you're going to maintain the quantum. Do you follow? I do. I, I mean, I do think that that because they have a very high threshold of residual profits. So you're talking about the most profitable uh, companies as well as the largest, uh, that that will create a situation where you can allocate uh, some uh, relatively small portion of profits to the market countries. I mean, I've thought about this a lot because as you probably know, I wrote at one point a very long article about the history of international taxation and the decisions that were made between source uh, countries and, and residence countries in the 1920s, a century ago, as to how to allocate uh, revenues through various sourcing rules and the like. And at that time, when you had bricks and mortar businesses, which is where the permanent establishment rules came in, I think it was pretty straightforward to say, well, we're just going to look at where the money is made and we're going to look at where the company is, is resident or headquartered or managed, uh, however you define it. Um, and what's happened is that the elimination of uh, the need to have a permanent establishment or to have bricks and mortar within the borders has, I think, made the claim of market countries stronger in the allocation of revenues. And in my mind, it's just a variation on source. That is that the market country has the right to some money because it's providing the infrastructure and the customers and, and data users, if you're talking about uh, search engines and the like. Um, and it, and, it, and it should get some share of the revenues. Now, this is a big step for the OECD. One should not underestimate it. And the amount of revenue, at least based on the economic studies that the OECD did last year, are not particularly large. It's $100 million of revenues that are going to be out, reallocated. Um, I don't know enough about what this hundred company uh, framework looks like to know where a hundred million dollars sort of fits in. But I, I think that what the treasury was saying was you weren't going to allocate very much revenue. You're going to allocate a hundred billion for a lot of companies. And we can probably allocate that much uh, with fewer companies as long as they're high profit companies. And, and, and so in that sense, I think they're suggesting that this is designed to cut back on the number of companies, but not designed to cut back on the share that will go to market countries overall. That's all they said in the slides. So we have to guess about what that means for amount A. I think um, there are lots of ways to get to an amount A, as you know, in my article, I really abandoned uh, the calculations that the OECD had used and show how you could get to a, a very uh, similar amount of revenue using a, a smaller allocation of a larger pot of profits. I use all profits when I think about allocating. Uh, although I did use, and this was a problem with the way I wrote the article, I did use a residual profits threshold. It just appears buried in a footnote footnote 58 that most people wouldn't have read. And that was because I sorted it out sort of toward the end of writing and the paper had already gotten too long for tax notes to be pleased. And so I didn't want to upset people. Uh, but if I were rewriting it, I would certainly bring that up. But, but I was requiring residual profits as was the OECD. But once you passed a threshold of residual profits, whatever that was, I was saying just allocate all the profits of the company to the market country. And I got to about the same amount of revenue 
using uh, an allocation percentage that was half of the percentage of uh, of the OECD because half of the profits of the companies that I was looking at were residual profits. And so um, given the treasury threshold, I suspect that more than half of the profits of these countries, of these companies, I keep saying countries, sorry about that, these companies are uh, residual profits. And so you're going to allocate a very small percentage and, and, you know, if they follow my lead, which I have no reason to believe they will, but perhaps they will, you just allocate a very small percentage of all of the profits of these companies and you'll get a hundred million dollar reallocation or in that ballpark um, through a different formula. The numbers will be different, but through the similar principles. So I don't think that's going to be a big stumbling block for them. The, the bigger stumbling block will be to what countries are, is this hundred million dollars being allocated? And that's another mystery. And I'm sure the members of the inclusive framework uh, and the finance ministers who are participating in the OECD process will be more interested in that question than they are so much in, in, in the other questions that we're talking about. So you have this idea that uh, in, in your paper, once you've passed the certain threshold for, for actually allocating the profits and coming up with an amount A, you don't really need to fret over whether something is a routine or a residual uh, profit. It seems very intuitive to me uh, when you look at the financial statements that multinationals do either on a consolidated basis or otherwise, they're not breaking things down between routine profits and residual profits as, as far as I can tell. Aren't we essentially asking them to come up with a calculation that they're not currently doing just to please the economists? I think so. I, I, I mean, I obviously abandoned the idea of allocating just residual profits because of its complexities and because of its potential for disputes. You've got worldwide book income. You can tell whether the company has a high profit margin or a low profit margin for the threshold matter so that they're either in or they're out. If they don't have high residual profits, they're out. If they've got high residual profits, then uh, under my a system, you would only allocate, you'd allocate some percentage of, of all profits. Obviously, if you're going to limit it to residual profits, then you start having to calculate residual profits. The question arises, do you have to do it on a business by business basis? Because residual profits vary greatly uh, for different lines of business. You know, whether you think about Apple or Amazon, which are my two examples in the, in the article, just because they were easy to think about. Amazon has very low uh, residual profits on a worldwide basis. Um, uh, Apple has high residual profits, but they vary greatly among their product, product lines. And as I said earlier, they don't do any bookkeeping based. I mean, they may know where they're making their money, of course, but they don't report profits on, on, on a profit line basis. So I don't understand why you wouldn't just allocate some smaller number percentage number of, of residual of all profits rather than trying to allocate a higher percentage of residual profits and getting into all these questions about where the residual profits are and to what countries they should be allocated and so forth. It, it's an enormous simplification, I think, in the OECD's thinking, but um, um, we'll see whether they, they head in that direction. Uh, they certainly know about my article. They sure do. And I, I think the Treasury Department knows about it as well. In fact, I'm just wondering if, if there's um, uh, this, this sense that your proposal and the Treasury, treasury slides that we've seen are, are very complementary because there's this one reference in the Treasury slides where they say they would like to see segmentation. Let me make sure I get the phrase here. Eliminated or minimized. So, so that's now the position of the U.S. Treasury, at least informally here. They, would, they, they agree with everything you've said, apparently, about segmentation and how it's needlessly complicated. And it, it's going to be the next transfer pricing. I mean, there's going to be just a boatload of litigation. If you're a young law student now, specialize in segmentation because you'll have employment for life, right? Uh, they say in here they want it eliminated 
or minimized. So could they just be thinking that the next time they have a slide stack they want to send to this uh, inclusive framework steering committee, they're going to propose what you've outlined because your proposal essentially would get rid of segmentation. Am I correct? Well, it certainly gets rid of it for the purposes of calculating amount A. Yes, yes. It does not necessarily get rid of the threshold of residual profits. You have to have a certain threshold of residual profits. Sure. But you can determine that, I think, by looking at country by country reporting, which is what I suggested. So you can look at where the residual profits are and how much there are in various countries. That's available on the on the country by country reports. The country by country reports, as does book income, have problems, but they're there. And so they can be used for a threshold. And then once you get that, you can then uh, allocate all profits and, and you can uh, provide offsets based on where the residual profits are located. I think that's an important part of my proposal. And I made that clear, I think, in the article, but it was certainly clear if you read the article and the footnote. So I'm hoping that you're right. That is that they're moving in the direction. It's, it's a great simplification. And otherwise you do end up with some segmentation. Now, I, you know, I mentioned Amazon because that's a company I looked at fairly closely. I should add in the plug for tax notes, I did it based on Marty Sullivan's calculations in an article that he published in tax notes, of course. Um, but in his article, and he was looking at profits for 2017, he concluded they didn't have on an aggregate basis residual profits because they have very low profits. And, and at that time they were having some losses from their third party uh, sales and, and obviously don't have a lot of profits in Whole Foods uh, and some of their retail sales, but they have a lot of profits in their cloud computing uh, system. There may be some companies like that that need you need to look at carefully, see if they're in, but once they're in, there's no reason not to allocate some portion of all the profits. And, and of course, you know, if we're thinking about market countries, you know, Amazon is shipping its products into these market countries and they can do it without uh, having a permanent establishment in many cases. And, uh, uh, and it makes sense to allocate profits to the market country without regard to where the residual profits are located. The residual profits, I think, the way I thought about this, are really reflecting largely profits from intellectual property. And where the intellectual property is located or owned or produced has really very little to do with where the products that result from that intellectual property are sold. And so if you're thinking about the playing of the market country, I never understood why the market country had a claim to residual profits. I mean, to, to, yeah, to only residual profits in principle, as opposed to a claim to any profits that happen from sales in their country, as long as you're within the system, whatever the system may be. So I'm hoping that that that, that piece of my article will be picked up by the OECD and the Treasury. I, I have no reason to, 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 to believe it will, but I, optimistic about that. As am I. Now, uh, before we sign off, I just wanted to, to, to run two more questions by you. First, wh when you think about the blueprint, it really is a document with a hybrid nature where you're taking what we're going to call formulary apportionment and you're sort of layering it on a system that's premised on arms, arms length concepts. And you know, maybe a hybrid nature is inevitable. But my first thinking was that when you combine these two things, are you sort of asking for trouble? Um, or is that just the way it's going to have to be? Well, I think the arm's length method, when you're talking about companies that have lots of intellectual property, itself involves the some kinds of formulary divisions um, in the arm's length transfer pricing regulations, they're called profit splits. Um, and you get down to the point where you've got to split profits and you don't have good connections that you can come up with about comparable prices and, and products and other things elsewhere. So I think we've already got a hybrid system in some sense where we're splitting profits. 
on one basis or another. And as I say, I believe the market country has a legitimate claim to some piece of that profit. And I think you can think of this in some ways as just a modification to the profit split piece of the arm's length pricing um, rules. Um, now, you know, I'm not as big a fan of arm's length pricing as the people who make their fortunes litigating about it are. But, um, um, but, but I don't think it's as big a departure uh, for, especially for companies that have a lot of uh, intellectual property uh, that it may seem. It, it is a formulary method. I make this clear in my article. It is, in fact, a sales-based formulary method. But if you're going to allocate some share of profits, and this is a profits-based allocation, not a, not a gross revenues-based allocation, which is true of the DSTs and the like, um, if you're going to do that, you know, and you're going to split profits and you're going to include the market countries, you know, you've got to have some method of doing it, uh, a little formula for a small amount of profits for a small number of companies as a, as a foot in the door here it doesn't seem to be a bad, bad way to go. And I don't think it's as big a departure as people who, 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 who like this project less than, uh, than, than many do uh, say. I just think that's a, a, a red herring in some way. The final question for your professor is about uh, comparative analysis with the U.S. states. When I think about this whole effort that, uh, even going back to BEPS, I'm reminded a little bit of the multi-state tax commission and, and, and things that are going on at the state level. Uh, do you see those same parallels? Well, it's, it's, I think the multi-state tax commission has got a buy-in from the states that is a higher level than the OECD has from the inclusive framework. And I think that the fact that the U.S. states are able to start with a federal calculation of taxable income and that the world uh, of the OECD is not able to start with that threshold makes the multi-state tax commission easier and more effective historically than the OECD has managed to be. So there is a parallel. They're, they're trying to create a multi a lateral uh, agreement. Um, and in that sense, there's a parallel. I do think that the, uh, if you think about uh, track and field, the multi-state tax commission is operating on a low hurdle race and OECD is operating on a high hurdle race. Very well said, Professor, and we'll leave it there for now. This continues to be uh, an evolving saga. We haven't heard the last word from the U.S. Treasury Department and uh, the OECD. They say they're going to be trying to, to, to put the pieces of the architecture together by mid-year. So maybe we'll have an opportunity this fall once we, we, we have a few more nuggets to work from to, to come back and revisit all of these issues. But I wanted to thank you for writing this article for us and thank you for making yourself available today for this discussion. It's been a real pleasure. Thank you, Bob. It's been my pleasure. All right. With that, we'll wrap it for today. And uh, thank you for reading Tax Notes. Bye-bye, everybody. Mm -hmm.